Welcome back. If you are struggling through these tough economic times or concerned about uh, the way things are going in your, your life or in the world, you might need to take a break and uh, stay tuned to this next segment. Author Teal Scott has written uh, a new book called The Sculptor in the Sky, and uh, she joins us right now. Teal, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, former Park City resident and uh, uh, avid skier, member yes. of the National Telemark team, yes. but uh, you turned your attentions away from the sporting world into the spiritual world. Tell me a little bit about this book. Uh, this book, The Sculptor in the Sky, is basically an informative book about the universe and the way that it works in terms of the energy that is making up all that is us. And it goes on to explain why happiness is an important commodity, not just for people individually, but for the universe at large. And then it goes on to explain how to achieve happiness. And uh, that's, you know, a lot of people think, oh, uh, you know, it's, it's through money, but we know money can't buy happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we, we've heard a lot of studies in recent years that have, you know, looked at happiness levels sort of on a, a, a country by country basis. And the U.S. does not uh, sit very high. No, uh, we don't on, do on very there. well. <laughs> why, why, you know, why, why is that? And uh, how, do you, how do you propose to, to change that? Uh, well, I would say that our country has a, a very individualistic focus. When I have visited other countries, I was struck by the interconnectedness, which is a large majority of what I teach about. It's the fact that the underlying truth to this universe is the truth of oneness. And other cultures have that sort of as a thread running through them, whereas ours is all about individual success. And when you start going for that, suddenly you lose this human connection, which is very important. What do you mean by the, the truth of oneness? The truth of oneness would be that, uh, well, I don't know if you've heard anything about the zero-point field, but basically everything that you see here, even though you perceive it as a solid thing, like this couch, you see it as a solid thing. It actually isn't. Most of what you are seeing as physical reality is actually what science would call negative space. Um, it's energy that's moving. Mm -hmm. So your sense of smell and sight and, and touch is what's telling you that it's solid when it isn't. So everything that is is basically made of this energy field. It's just expressing itself in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so if everything at its most elemental level is energy, then everything is the same. Because, and so uh, you would like people to be able to tap into yes. some, some of that energy. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm gathering it's not an easy process uh, to, to necessarily do, or, or is it? I don't know, because I can't speak for other people. I was kind of <laughs> born seeing the things that I see, but I think that in order to achieve happiness, you at least have to expand your awareness to be able to feel if not see this kind of truth in the universe and you said you were you were born able to to see this uh you know yes. having sort of you know i guess extrasensory uh <laughs> perceptions to to yes. put it in you know sort of uh you know x-files terms uh but what, what how do you see things uh, or you know can you can you explain how how you see things differently than the rest of us uh, um from what I've gathered, a lot of people see n negative space between objects. I don't see air as negative space. It all looks like energy fields that are running into each other. So to me, from my perception, I'm breathing in your energy right now and vice versa. Same with the couch. And basically, there's no definitive line where one thing starts and the other ends. And I also see um, much, many more entities in the room than however many I assume that you perceive. And uh, colors, I see colors around people. It would be the human electromagnetic field. And is this something you see all the time? I mean, is yep. this something that gets, gets confusing as you, yeah. as you try to make your way through, uh, you know, through, through the world, you know, that uh, you know, you, you're seeing lots of different things sort of in front of you? I'm used to it, so <laughs> I'm pretty sure if somebody stepped into the way that I see the world, it would be pretty confusing, but having grown up this way, it's sort of normal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, having had that, I mean, you've, you've led a, a, an, a fascinating uh, life, to, to say the least. I mean, yes. it, at least, you know, recently, even, you know, as as an you know, accomplished, accomplished here, member, member of the, the Telemark team, did the, you know, did those 
these abilities, you know, help you as as a skier, <laughs> and, and is it something you know that the rest of us can learn? Uh, no, it was a serious detriment, actually. I used sports to try to get away from this because. When you are so focused in the body, it's much easier to be in physical reality where I get pulled off by all sorts of things. Like if I'm sitting in a room, I'm pulling in probably three times more information than the average person. So going to a race where there's that many nerves around that many athletes was really, really difficult for me. Same with travel. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but sports really was my phase of trying to run away from doing this stuff that I've been doing my whole entire life. So I've sort of started in the spiritual way, came out of it into sports and went now come back into what brought you uh to the point where you said i need to embrace this again and i really need to to understand it and and write about it well um i went through probably five or six years of therapy because of the childhood that i went through and i got to a point in healing where i just decided i can fight against this for the rest of my life which doesn't work or i can see what this can really do for people and also uh, see sort of uh, if embracing it will change the way that I live my life in terms of happiness. I mean you can't live your life happy fighting against everything mm -hmm. which is the major problem in America. We tend to fight against problems instead of focusing towards the solution. So how would you have people use this book how you know maybe maybe walk us through sort of you know some some of the processes that uh that the book uh advises so in the first few chapters basically i unravel people's reality <laughs> to put it lightly uh, you blow your mind you blow their mind and then bit. uh and then help put it back together yeah so you know i'm basically explaining everything that you think about this world let's pull it down and then build it back up so that you understand that you're creating your reality every day with your thoughts. Once you understand that, you want to be more deliberate about the thoughts that you're thinking and the way that you're focusing in this world. And from that point, basically, I'm teaching people how to practice focus. So, basically, um, one of the processes that I teach is to go on a... Uh, happiness hunting walk essentially where you step out your door and you go on a 10 minute walk and during this 10 minute walk all you're doing is looking for things to appreciate in the environment and what you'll notice very fast is that you have a very negative orientation people do just in general you're, it's cold it's yes. windy uh, oh i don't like that yeah but if you're literally teaching your orientation to focus in on things that you do appreciate and you do like then your brain, because your neural pathways will form based on the thoughts that you're thinking, basically. Because you're creating this neural pathway, your brain will literally make that your dominant orientation. This is why people who are optimistic people tend to stay that way. It's because when they walk into a room, you know, people who have a negative orientation will say, oh, I don't like that, whereas they will literally not see it because their orientation is towards pretty flowers. I like but, that couch but, color. But you're not asking people to be, you know... Pollyanna, no. and uh, just is, <laughs> every, everything is everything is wonderful all the time. No, this is exactly the opposite. I'm just teaching people how to focus appropriately. And what's been the reaction uh, from from readers to to this book? Way better than I thought. Uh, I just got on Amazon actually, and I've got some pretty good reviews from people who have read this and uh, are looking at life a little bit differently. But I assume that eventually I'm going to run into some controversy because I often do in my life and uh you know th this is something i mean you you mentioned you know you have these these abilities to you see the you see the world differently that is that is also part of your story as yes. as as you mentioned uh you, you grew up in a abusive uh yes. household and um, i mean actually I mean, my household was pretty gentle but oh. what, what happened was i grew up in a town a very small town that was predominantly lds but there was a cult that was in that town called the Blood Covenant, and they believe that it's their job to rid the earth of evil. And being sort of an offshoot of the LDS religion, they think that priesthood comes directly from Joseph Smith to men. So if a woman is exhibiting the kind of extrasensory abilities that I was, then it means it's a gift of the devil. But they think it's their job, essentially, to brutalize it out of you. So... I was tortured for 13 years. And how were you eventually able to get, you know, away from from that and and then and 
you know, you, you mentioned, you know, five years of therapy, but uh, yes. I imagine there's probably some, some more to it th than that. Yes, well, without getting into serious details, mm. because it's an incredibly gruesome story, um, basically, I had met this very sweet boy from Park City, <laughs> and uh, he started hearing a little bit about the stuff I was going through, and he suggested just to stay at his house. And I realized this will come as a shock to most people, but it had not occurred to me until that moment that I could, you know, not go home, back home. So I just didn't. He hid me in his basement, essentially, in his basement apartment for the last five years, <laughs> and I just didn't go back. So that was that in combination with a major mistake on the man's part. I'll call him Mr. X, the one who mm -hmm. pulled me into the cult, essentially made a, a very big mistake one day programming me. At 19. Wow, it's it, it's an amazing story and uh, an amazing uh, p piece of work here. And if people do want to uh, pick it up, you said uh, Amazon. Do you also have Amazon. your your own website? Uh, I do. It's www.thespiritualcatalyst.com and Expanding Heart on Park City on the thing on Main Street, right mm -hmm. on Park City. They carry it. So. Fantastic, Teal Scott. Thank you so much for uh, coming in and thank you best so of much luck for in the future. Me. Thank you. We'll be back uh, right after this to talk about uh, the Utah Symphony and Utah Operas in the coming season. Don't go away.